Hello everyone, uh, my name is Kyle Matthews. I'm the Executive Director of the Montreal Institute for Genocide and Rights Studies. Very pleased to welcome you today to Concord University for what is um, a very, uh, uh, I think, interesting uh, discussion, one that's, um, uh, that's in the news every day, one that's being generating discussion in Canada, and that is the topic of uh, human rights, China, and the future of democracies. Um, we have a very distinguished uh, group of speakers today that are going to uh, speak from experience um, and talk about specific issues. Um, but I just say is that our institute, we have you know, been approached in the past couple of years by members of the Uber community to discuss human rights and what's happening in the Uber community. Um, we put a lot of public events. We've had uh, different people speak about 5G and what that means. So, so the issue of, of, of China human rights is a, is a growing um, issue that, that I'm seeing more and more of my colleagues speak about from Canada to internationally. Um, I'm not sure if any of you saw yesterday, Ken Roth, uh, the Executive Director of Human Rights Watch, um, attempted to fly to Hong Kong to present uh, Human Rights Watch's annual uh, report on human rights around the planet. He was denied entry um, into Hong Kong. Um, and I also saw that a friend of mine, a, a senior executive of Human Rights Watch, were launching uh, their report yesterday in New York City, and their report launch activity was also disrupted by certain individuals. So there, there is enormous pressure, uh, even on universities in Canada, not to discuss some of the issues we're discussing today. So I want to thank everyone for coming. I want to thank everyone for being civil. Um, we're not here to blame anyone. We're here to have a discussion and make sense of what's happening uh, in our world. So with further ado, uh, we're going to we have four distinguished speakers. Our last speaker has to leave here at two, so I'm going to be on the timeline uh, on that, but we're going to have each person is going to give a presentation between seven to ten minutes or, or whatever, and then we're going to then uh, have some time to have a Q and A with our expert speakers. So our first expert speaker. Um, so I'll introduce each one of them, and then I'll, I'll let them take take the floor. Um, I won't read all their bios because they're very extensive. But our first is Margaret McQuaid Johnson. Margaret has uh, deep experience with China. She's a fellow at numerous universities. She's involved with the Asia Pacific Foundation. And uh, just recently, uh, the Toronto Star did a fantastic article about you and your, uh, your uh, public speaking about, you know, data about China and Canadian foreign policy. So Margaret will give us a general presentation on her thoughts on Canadian-China relations and other issues that have, have dealt with those relations um, in the past. Following Margaret, we have Sharap Thurchin. Sharap is, uh, we had in the summer at our Red City conference to speak on a panel about human rights in China. Sharap, he's joined the Canada Tibet Committee in January 2018 as executive director. So he'll be speaking predominantly about the Tibetan community and, and, and human rights issues. Followed by Sharap, we have Dr. Benjamin Fung from McGill University. Uh, uh, Benjamin is a Canada Research Chair in Data Mining for Cybersecurity. Um, lots of uh, scientific publications. It was recently in a great uh, CBC Montreal article, or Canada Canada article on, on uh, intimidation of Uber uh, minorities in Canada. And he'll be, I think, speaking, uh, maybe I'm jumping the gun, but a bit on the 5G discussion, which some of you have followed that. There's been a lot of debate in Western countries about 5G, is it a security threat? Uh, what, what does all of that? So we're going to have Benjamin weigh in on that. And our last speaker, Dilmarat Mahmoud, who is a PhD candidate at McGill University. Uh, we've met with him many times. Um, he's, a, he's a member of the Uyghur minority from China. Uh, so he's going to speak from his personal experience about what's happening uh, to the Uyghur community. So with nothing further ado, I'd like to actually ask Margaret to take the floor and begin her presentation. Thanks very much, Mark. So thank you and good afternoon. I'd like to start by saying that human rights issues in China are nothing new. The Hendrix Flowers campaign, Great Leap Forward in the 50s, the Cultural Revolution in the 60s, all trampled on individual human rights in a myriad of ways. Canada helped those starving in the late 50s by sending wheat. Some of you may not have heard of the Xidan Democracy Law. Um, students and workers started calling for a modernization uh, engaging with tech democracy. They put up big character posters describing the democratic and human rights system that they would like to see. These are my photos 
at the wall in 1979. You can see more than 100 people gathered around talking. But after encouraging them for a number of months, the government started charging the organizers and gave them long prison terms. And after the Tiananmen massacre, the Canadian government invited any Chinese who were in Canada at the time to stay and become citizens. A professor of economics lived with my family for a year and a half, and we were able to get a son out of China to join him. So China's approach to human rights is fundamentally different than Canada's. While we see the Universal Decor Declaration of Human Rights as a foundation for the rights of individuals and the behaviors of countries, China sees it as a document written by Western countries that is not relevant to China. Rather, China points to the fact that since 1978, it has lifted more than 800 million people out of poverty, a significant accomplishment indeed, but not the same as ensuring individual human rights. In fact, China does not respect individual rights, except when Ms. Meng of Huawei was arrested, and then they said very strongly that her arrest violated her human rights. They publish white papers on human rights, but those focus on economic development, and where they do promise human rights, such as having a lawyer if you're detained, their written commitments bear no relationship to the reality of detention in China. For years, they've had bilateral human rights dialogues with other nations, but Canada stopped ours in 2005 because the talks were not leading to any progress. Human Rights Watch applauded that move, saying that the dialogues just served to give China cover for inaction. We've also seen a disturbing trend that other countries are complicit in China's lack of human rights. For example, Greece vetoed an EU effort year, several years ago to sanction China for its abrogation of human rights. And Arab nations have supported China's re-education of Uyghur Muslims in Xinjiang. I'm not going to focus much on that atrocity since uh, Dilmarat will cover that in uh, his remarks, but I look forward this, to discussing it in the Q&A. So the top four photos are those Canadians who have been detained or had their sentences upgraded to execution in retaliation for the uh, arrest of Meng Wanzhou. There are other Canadians who have also been unjustly detained and or charged, including Julia and Kevin Garrett in retaliation for the extradition of Su Bin uh, from Vancouver to the U.S. Hussein Chalil, who was arrested in Uzbekistan and brought to China in 2007 and sentenced in a secret uh, trial to life in prison, la later changed to 20 years. He's from Burlington. And a B BC couple who were detained in a commercial dispute in uh, 2016. And these are just a few examples. Other countries have experienced the kind of pressure that China is bringing on us now, such as Japan, South Korea, Australia, the US, and Taiwan. And of course, China has detained millions of its own citizens, with some dying in custody. I want to make it clear that people who are detained in China are not in a hotel room with an official coming to chat every few days. To really understand what Michael Kovrig and Michael Stavor are going through, I'd recommend the book by the Garretts, Two Tears on the Window, and the book, The People's Republic of the Disappeared, which is the stories of Chinese activists and a Swede, uh, Peter Dallin, who, who were detained. Human Rights Watch published a report called Tiger Chairs and Cell Bosses in 2015 that describes the conditions. And I'll go through a few of them. You can be detained, detained for up to six months. Michael Covert and Michael Spavor were detained for five months and then transferred to a prison. Uh, you have no access to a lawyer or family during any of this time. In fact, often family members will be detained too to put pressure on the detainee. Uh, so Peter Dallin's girlfriend was detained for that reason. Um, foreigners get half hour consular visit by an embassy official once a month, but they were very severely constrained as to what they can discuss. If you're a Chinese Canadian, China often doesn't recognize the, ch the Canadian citizenship and does not allow the embassy access. That's what happened to Sam and Jamil, even when the case goes to court. 
The cell is sometimes padded so you can't commit suicide, and often it has no window. The lights are on all the time, <coughs> and early on in your detention, you are often deprived of sleep, with an officer <coughs> screaming in your face as soon as your eyes start to close. This is to wear your defenses down. Two officers are in the cell at all times, and they make note of everything you do, writing in notebooks. The artist Ai Weiwei was detained for 81 days, and he created small uh, clay dioramas or sculptures showing what it was like. So this is one of them uh, showing him in bed with the two officers over him, uh, watching everything. Uh, you're taken to a, a different room for questioning, and that's six to eight hours a day. Usually during the questioning, you have to sit in a tiger chair, and everyone who has sat in one says it's a form of torture with your wrists and ankles clamped to the chair in vices. As soon as the questioning starts, it's clear that they have all your emails and cell phone records. They ask detailed questions that focus on specific emails and individual contacts because they're hoping to get information that could implicate others as well as yourself. You have to sign documents, sometimes daily, swearing to the testimony you've given, even if you don't read the Chinese that your documents are signing. Sometimes there are televised forced confessions. After six months, you're moved to a, a prison, uh, but the tiger chair inter interrogations still continue. You are usually in a cell with 18 to 28 others. There's poor food or some meals, there's no food at all. The toilet is out in the open in the cell. Um, a formal arrest is usually at the six month mark, but it can be up to a year before charges are laid after that. And until then, there is no lawyer. The Michaels, our Michaels Kovrig and Michaels Babel, have not seen a lawyer yet, more than a year after they were kidnapped. They can get one letter a month, uh, and one family member uh, can kind of coordinate messages from the others into the letter. The lawyer uh, is only allowed when charges are laid, and often that's a court-appointed lawyer, and you have to sit in the tiger chair well, during your meeting with your lawyer. Um, the court hearing may be many months after that, with sentencing months or even years after that. In the in the past few years, the human rights situation in China uh, In the past few years, the human rights situation in China has become much worse. Starting in 2015, there were hundreds of detentions of activists. Where in the past human rights lawyers might have been pulled in for questioning and then released a few hours later as a way of intimidating them? They are now given long pr prison sentences. In the wake of the 2015 detentions, Canada's ambassador, Guy Saint-Jacques, put out a strong statement saying he had seen a worrisome increase in the number of Chinese citizens jailed, merely for peacefully expressing their views. And he also objected to the rendering of the activists back to China. Very so often, the activists um, are just trying to help others in their community where they see injustice, like expropriation of homes without a compensation. This happens a lot in China because you can own your house, but you don't own the land on which it sits, so it can be taken at any time. People protesting serious pollution of their community rivers and air, and also labor leaders who protest su sudden closures or job safety issues will be sent to jail. Often people disappear or are detained just, after, just before Christmas, as it's a time when people aren't paying close attention. And that's what happened this year, with more than a dozen people detained and some are still missing. Human rights lawyer Wang Chuan Zhang is still in prison since 2015, and his young son is not allowed to go to school. The photo of, that you see here in the bottom right was taken the day his mother came to take him home. He's sitting way at the back. He loved school and he was really upset and the prison authorities fully informed Wong that his son is not allowed to go to school. That's a severe punishment for a parent and is meant to intimidate other human rights defenders. The new social credit system monitors WeChat and Weibo discussions of Chinese citizens to score each citizen poorly or well, depending on what they say about the government and Xi Jinping, 
any references to June 4th or Tiananmen Square, whether they take out the garbage on time, whether they pay off their loans promptly, to name just a few. In 2018, 18 million people were not allowed to take flights and 5 million were not permitted to travel on high-speed trains. Others lost job promotions and were not able to send their kids to good schools and many other punishments. Of course, this is causing people to self-censor what they say, which is exactly what the regime wants. And a similar system has been put in place now for companies and non-governmental organizations, even those from other countries operating in China, so Canadian companies in China. If the company does not pay its taxes in full or complains about government policies, it'll be punished. And if some of its employees don't have a good social credit uh, score, the firm will be punished. And also if its suppliers aren't, aren't uh, don't have a good score, the, the firm will be punished. New facial recognition technology with artificial intelligence combined with CCT cameras literally everywhere are tracking where everyone is going. Of course, scientists and engineers are developing the technologies being used in these new contexts, sometimes in collaboration with Western researchers, including those in Canada. In Xinjiang, a police app is being used to closely monitor everyone's movements. The police officers themselves don't like it because they have to do the tedious work of inputting all the information on each person's movements into the app. And a company called Flytech developed voice recognition technology, and Uyghurs have been taken individually to the local police station to register their voice in different modulations so the police will be able to monitor phone conversations and know exactly who is talking. This is the same voice te recognition technology that's on more than 1.2 billion Huawei phones. Chinese professors and students on Western campuses are often pressured not to criticize China. Rather than feeling free to participate in open and honest academic debate. If they do criticize, the consulate or the embassy may threaten retaliation against their families back home. The consequence of this is often self-censorship. Again, that's exactly the effect that the Chinese government wants. And Western U university administrations have found, found themselves under pressure to cancel events that might be critical of China. This message was brought home in Canada in 2010 when the University of Calgary gave the Dalai Lama an honorary degree, and China delisted it as an institution that could receive Chinese students. As you know, foreign students are important to a university's base funding. I was interested to read a report uh, recently by an international NGO called Scholars at Risk, which reported on many cases of Chinese government pressures against Western universities in the past few years. I was very pleased to see that in every case in Canada, the university did not bend to the pressure and events went on as planned. That wasn't the case in other countries. Universities may also want to incorporate the guidelines proposed by Human Rights Watch, such as having an administration contact available to support Chinese students under pressure and reporting incidents when they do occur. And Universities Canada has also come out recently with a set of guidelines. My substantive area of expertise on China is science and innovation. So in closing, I'd like to flag a policy that hasn't gotten much attention in the West, and that's China's integration of military and civilian technology development, which was described in the 2016 Strategy for Innovation Driven Development. This is being led by President Xi himself and scientists and engineers and companies across the country in a vast array of disciplines are mandated to engage with military counterparts to identify military applications for their work. This goes beyond uh, simple dual use because they're proactively creating new military technologies from unrelated fields. This therefore becomes a risk that many Canadian researchers won't be aware of in areas like bio, biotechnology, artificial intelligence, and advanced materials, where I know that our lead researchers don't want to assist even our own military 
But for many years, they uh, closely collaborated with scientists, uh, with China. So uh, I've been briefing some of them to alert them to the risk that they could be contributing directly to China's military AI technologies. There's also another issue of Chinese um, PLA scientists and engineers being sent to universities in Canada and other Western countries. A study by the Australian Strategic Policy Institute showed that Canada is number three in the yellow, uh, the left-hand graph, uh, with 84 joint publications with military universities in 2017. Um, we were higher even uh, the three years prior to that. And we have three universities in the top 10 worldwide in the number of joint publications over an 11 year period. University of Waterloo, U of T, and McGill. We should be trying to get ourselves off these top 10 lists. So I'm going to stop there, and I look forward to your questions in the uh, Q&A. Thank you very much, uh, Margaret. Now, Sharab, the floor is yours. We're going to move the floor. Yes, thanks. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to everyone. Uh, thank you to the organizers for having me. Uh, I work with the Canada Pacific Committee. Uh, we work to defend and promote human rights and democratic freedoms of Tibetan people. And today, I wanted to talk about a question that uh, I often get asked. Uh, the question is, has Tibet been forgotten? And the answer, unfortunately, is further towards the spectrum of yes than no. And I'll share some ideas on how we got to this point. It's been over uh, 70 years since China illegally invaded uh, Tibet. And 70 years is a uh, long time, uh, long enough for the oppressors to change the course of history, long enough for the oppressed to get used to the life they lead, and long enough for the international community to lose interest on the issue. And this is exactly what seems to have uh, happened with Tibet. Uh, so for example, Hollywood filmmaker Martin Scorsese made a movie, a biographical movie on his whole native Dalai Lama called Kundin in 1997. In the same year, uh, Hollywood star Brad Pitt acted in another uh, Tibet movie called Seven Years in Tibet. Uh, but 20 years later, we have celebrities hesitate to uh, not only you know, uh, forget about acting in movies related to Tibet, but hesitate to speak on Tibet uh, because of the possible actions from China. So recently, uh, pop star Lady Gaga got banned from China just because she posted his honest the Dalai Lama for an interview in 2016. Uh, Canada's own position on Tibet is another testament to the question, has Tibet been forgotten? Canada's position on Tibet has been changing uh, over the years, uh, from recognizing Tibet as an independent state in 1950 to that of an uh, autonomous region in 1987. And then eventually in 1998, uh, reached a state where Canada's position in Tibet is that disregards and discredits the uh, His Holiness-led institution, Central Tibetan Government, also known as Tibetan Government in exile. So how did Canada and the international community go from uh, recognizing, uh, oh, sorry, condemning uh, China's illegal annexation of Tibet to actually recognizing Tibet as an integral part of uh, China? Um, why is it that so many people, government officials, uh, journalists, politicians, uh, scholars, celebrity, uh, refrain from speaking truth about uh, Tibet? Why the hesitation? There could be a lot of reasons, including uh, business deal cancellations, visa denials, um, <coughs> diplomatic repercussions, and so on. But there's one reason that has quietly evaded our attention. Uh, Beijing has successfully implemented <coughs> a social
Soviet era strategy called uh, reflexive control. A strategy where government feeds a manufactured information to target group uh, for so long, uh, so consistently, that target group eventually uh, begin to perceive that information as true. <coughs> and this is exactly what, again, uh, seems to have happened uh, with the Tibet issue. Um, so just uh, let me okay. Sorry. Um, so because of this strategy, today uh, not many uh, individuals, countries, uh, believe that you know that Tibet uh, was a uh, independent country at one point of time. Uh, by getting international community to accept the notion that uh, Tibet at one point was a historical part of China, uh, China has got international community to exactly where it wants. Uh, so this has really helped China to evade any pressure from international community by saying that anything that is happening in Tibet is an internal issue for China. So, and this has really helped uh, China perpetuate the ongoing human rights violation in Tibet, violations of uh, political, social, cultural, and uh, civil rights. Uh, more than 164 Tibetans have uh, committed self-immolation, uh, which is an act of uh, burning yourself uh, on the protest of China's occupation of Tibet. And the recent you know, uh, return of China to the totalitarian ideology has led to even more control over Tibetans. We have uh, activists, um, scholars, uh, advocates, anyone who advocates for the uh, rights of Tibetans gets arrested. Um, we have uh, a good example is um, Tibetan language advocate Tashi Wangchuk, who got sentenced for <coughs> five years, and his only crime was that he appeared in a New York documentary where he advocated for the preservation and the promotion of Tibetan language. So this is a very, uh, I think, example, uh, one of the uh, examples of how China takes uh, even language preservation as threat to the survival of Chinese Communist Party. Uh, the abuse of human rights goes beyond just human beings. Um, I don't know how many of you know this, but Tibet is also known as the third pole in the world, has over 46,000 glaciers, and uh, is also known as the, uh, as the uh, largest collection of uh, accessible fresh water. Uh, it's also the source of some of the largest river in South Asia that feeds uh, billions of people. Uh, and so China has successfully turned Tibet into one giant uh, uh, mining and uh, damming uh, area. And so this has uh, had a direct uh, consequence for many people living in the um, uh, down south of uh, Tibet, uh, mainly in India, China, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Vietnam. Uh, so to resolve all these challenges, uh, what does uh, Tibetan administration, uh, what does the uh, Tibetan leaders, what does His Holiness the Dalai Lama uh, do to solve all these challenges? Uh, so the approach taken by the Dalai Lama and, the, and by the leaders of Central Tibetan Administration, which is based in Dharamsala, is uh, Called middle way approach, which seeks uh, genuine autonomy, which promises the rights of language, uh, culture, self determination, and not seek complete independence uh, to resolve all these issues that I uh, just mentioned. But to resolve this issue, it is very important that uh, we uh, realize the China's fake historical narrative, which is uh, making people believe, making international community believe that Tibet was uh, at one point uh, historically a part of China. So any negotiation that really begins from the point uh, that Tibet was a historical uh, would you know, move toward, more towards the, what China wants, but not what uh, Tibetan administration wants. So the whole idea of middle way approach would uh, not satisfy the actual needs of Tibetan people 
if the world continues to believe that Tibet was uh, historically part of China, and this is exactly what China wanted, and they have successfully used this psychological phenomenon called reflexive control to put in the minds of the international community that uh, uh, China, Tibet at one point was uh, part of uh, China. Uh, so that, that's just a brief uh, introduction to um, Tibet issues, but more in, in, in context to what's happened to Tibetan in Canada, uh, especially in, in, in context to the interference from China, I would like to share uh, two examples that happened in the recent uh, months. We had uh, China interference supported by the, uh, we believe it was supported by Chinese consulate in Toronto, an establishment of Tibetan association, uh, which had only participation of four to five Tibetans, but uh, maybe uh, stronger participation from Chinese community uh, so I shouldn't say generalize all Chinese because they are mainly from the uh, CCP uh, community. <laughs> and the community that the fake Tibetan associations forge uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's signature, forge uh, Minister uh, of Immigration Ahmed Hussein's signature uh, to mislead Canadians, to mislead people in believing that there is human rights in Tibet, there is prosperity, economic growth in Tibet. Um, so we worked with the Canada Tibet Committee and uh, Tibetan Association across Canada. We worked to bring this to the attention of Global Affairs Canada, to the attention of Prime Minister Office, that there is a forgery, there is a systematic attempt from the Chinese government to mislead Canadians uh, into uh, believing that uh, lives of Tibetans are good. Uh, the second foreign interference, as many of you might have heard, uh, is related to Chimi um, Hamo, a young Tibetan woman who is a student union president of University of Toronto Scarborough campus, got uh, thousands of, uh, if not uh, more than that, um, online threat uh, from uh, Chinese students who could be from China or in Canada, uh, threatening her with the death threat, uh, rape threats, uh, family threats, all kinds of threats. Um, she currently works in the campus with the walkie-talkie that as, as her security. Uh, and as you might understand, there's a, the Chinese students have become a major source of revenue for many universities. And so that really um, pushes universities to not take any kind of strong actions when it comes to such events. So this is just a brief uh, ideas that I would like to share with you. Thank you. Thank you, Shay Rock. Um, so next, I'd like to ask yeah, Benjamin Fung to come and um, sure. give you a presentation. Hello, uh, my name is Ben, and uh, I have two hats today. So on one hand, I am a professor from the queue specializing in AI cybersecurity. And on the other hand, I am uh, I represent the Action Free Hong Kong Montreal Group. Okay. So today's topic is infiltration of the Chinese Commerce Party from Hong Kong to Canada. So I'm sure in the last six months, you have received a lot of news from Hong Kong regarding the democratic movement. Uh, from having two million of people marching on the street peacefully to nowadays having many uh, scenes of police brutality on the street. Okay. Um, so I would say the police and the, even the Hong Kong government are just the uh, puppets. The real puppet master behind is the CCP, is the Chinese Communist Party. Um, so just to have a quick introduction uh, about Hong Kong. So Hong Kong is a special administrative region in southern China. Although it's a small city, it has seven million people. Um, it has seven million people. Maybe um, if Simon, if you can just step one. Yeah, because this is exactly the uh, exact. exact. Yeah. Um, so seven, it has seven million people living in there, and it is the third largest financial center in the world, following uh, New, uh, New York and London. <coughs> And 
uh, the GDP per capita is $48,000 per year. And similar to Canada, it has three universities that are ranked in the top 50, although Hong Kong is very tiny compared to Canada. Okay. So just have a quick history about uh, Hong Kong. So in 1984, the British government and the Chinese government, they signed a joint declaration um, outlining the principle of one country, two system to be applied in Hong Kong after 1997. And during the 1980s, during the discussion period, um, the British government actually wrote three letters to the Chinese government. And the Chinese government respond, confirming that Hong Kong will have the universal suffrage after 1997. So Hong Kongers did expect to have the real democratic system in around 2007, that is around 10 years after the return. Okay. That's the expectation and promise. Um, and then let's fast forward to 2014. Okay. In 2014, this, the Chinese government make a decision. It's called the 831 decision. Basically saying that Hong Kong will not have the universal suffrage. And, uh, and this ignited the uh, umbrella movement in 2014. And the Hong Kong protesters occupied the central area for 79 days. And then the, between 2014 and 2019, the Hong Kong government expand the police force to 30,000 people. And uh, this is how they, so the consequence that you see on TV nowadays is actually um, because of the broken promise. And uh, this is how the CCP responds to the democratic movement uh, to Hong Kongers. Uh, they put the democratic activists to, to jail, uh, police brutality, arbitrary arrest, sexual assault against protesters. They hire gangsters to attack protesters. These are horrible, but don't underestimate this one. This is the white terror. Some of my friends, now they even afraid to go to Facebook and click on the like button. Because clicking on the like will expose expose their political view. This will result being fired by their employer. And uh, of course the Chinese government like using fake news, AI recognitions, uh, facial recognitions, and walking, walking pattern recognitions on protesters. So um, I would like to emphasize that the tyranny is not just limited to Tibet, Uyghur, and Hong Kong. A certain degree it has already been expanded, exported to other countries. So let's shift our attention to Canada. Um, these are some of this uh, CCP's infiltrations in the Canadian academics. Um, for example, many large uh, Chinese companies, they make huge investments to universities, especially in the IT and engineering sectors, such as Huawei, they make a lot of investment. And they offer extremely attractive package to professors to researchers. Um, for example, when I say attractive, I mean something like three times the salary of a professor. Um, um, another example is the uh, Confucius Institutes in Canada. So the CCP, they create many Confucius Institutes uh, around the world. On the surface, these institutes are the just like a language school and they promote, uh, they, they promote uh, cultural studies. But in fact, they are propaganda machines. They want to increase the soft power of China in other countries. And CSIS actually point out that um, they could be potential spy offices in Canada. And uh, it's not too difficult to, if you just search on the web, it's not too difficult to find evidence of human rights discrimination in this uh, constitution. So, um, in my opinion, this is a threat to academic freedom in, in Canada. And these are a list of Confucius Institutes in Canada. Uh, the red one has already been closed okay, because of the noise from the uh, Canadians. And there's one uh, nearby, there's one uh, at Boston College. So these are other dimensions of infiltration. For example, uh, one of the newspaper columnists, uh, he is a, a columnist for a local Chinese media. He got fired just because he wrote an article to criticize the Chinese official. Again, this is happening in Canada. Um, of course, the CCP, they often uh, mobilize the uh, Chinese community or students 
to do anti protest. For example, when our group, when we organize peaceful demonstrations, often there's a group of anti protesters sitting at the standing in the back, or sometimes they will even attack some of our supporters. Um, okay, so let me switch my hat back to a professor. Uh, I'm sure you have heard about these terminologies. AI, autonomous vehicles, self-driving cars, smart city, smart health, uh, smart home. Right? So all these new technologies, in a couple of years, they will be linked together by 5G, which, sorry, which is the, um, which is the, which will be the, the backbone of our future society. And uh, 5G is not just a faster internet connection. It's more than that. It will bring. Uh, tremendous changes to our day to our daily life. For example, if we combine five G with self driving car, our future intersection will look something like this. Okay, this is an animation; it's not real. <laughs> um, but this really reflects what scientists have in mind. Okay, we believe that with five G, with self driving, uh, with self driving car all the vehicles can be connected together, they can talk to each other, so that in at intersections, they do not have to stop anymore. We can just go like this. Um, the key point that I want to bring out here is that 5G is a critical input. It's a critical infrastructure. It's important for the, mm -hmm. uh, for the, for the, for the country. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> for, the second, for, the second, for the second point is that 5G is a, it's a very complex system. Okay? Uh, some people may say that, okay, we can use any vendor, we can use ma any manufacturer to build our 5G network. And then uh, we just have to check. We just have to check the security before we use it. Okay, some people say that. My response is that um, 5G network is not a static system. We need to continuously updating this. We need to patch it. We need to patch the vulnerabilities. We need to update it in order to expand its capability. Okay. So, um, it's just like your laptop. You, you, you rely on Microsoft, you rely on Apple to keep updating your laptop, your phone, because you trust that company. Okay. So, and in the cybersecurity world, we always say that um, any secure system is just one update, one update away to, becoming, to, 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 uh, to become a spy layer. Okay, so, uh, and it's very difficult to guarantee every update to be clean when you have a, such a compact system. So that's the second point. The third point <coughs> is that, um, the third point is that the Chinese government ba basically controls every large corporation in China. Okay. This is the revenue uh, distributions of Huawei. 52% uh, of its income is coming from China and a large portion is actually from the government. So for the CCP to control the company, it's just about <coughs> getting a budget. Um, and most importantly, the companies, they are obligated to cooperate with the Chinese intelligence agency in, uh, in China. So these are the three points. Why right? 5G network is critical. It is complex, hard to defend, you need to trust the company. And the third point is that the um, the 5G has a full control, oh sorry, the CCP has a five has a full control on the 5G uh, manufacturer. <coughs> so I just want to bring a very simple question to the Canadian society. Why should we take the risk? Why should we allow the companies that are fully controlled by a foreign dictatorial government to develop the most critical infrastructures for us in Canada? Uh, to wrap up my talk, I would like to address this question. Why should Canadians care about the developments in Hong Kong, in Xinjiang, in Tibet, in Taiwan? Okay. So because these regions will remain to be test cases in the global context between the liberal international order, national order. If we allow the patriotic Chinese to continue bullying and interfering, the pro-Hong Kong, pro uyghur pro-Tibet, uh, 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 supporters in in Canada, one day they may eventually interfere 
other dimensions of freedom of other Canadians. And finally, I would like to request the Parliament to invoke the Magnitsky sanctions against uh, government officials in Hong Kong and China who violate the human rights. Thank you very much. Lisa, I'd like to invite Demo to take the floor. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to the event. First of all, let me thank uh, the organizers. And then on the, on the left, you can see our new NGO. We just uh, found it. Uh, hopefully, we can. Make, you can contribute to the um, human rights uh, cause in, in China. Uh, the topic is about the Uyghur voices, stories from occupied East Turkestan. Xinjiang is a, is, an, uh, is a colonial name, so we don't want to use that. East Turkestan is the original name. Let's talk about the history of the Uyghur. East Turkestan is just about, about uh, Tibet, you can see. Some people call it Second Tibet. Okay. So, uh, the same story. Uh, 55 officially, uh, Uyghurs are one of the 55 officially uh, recognized minority groups in China, ethnically Turkic, follow Sunni Islam, and uh, during the 18th century, uh, Manchurian Empire uh, occupied, annexed, uh, annexed the, the East Turkestan region into China. Proper, and uh, the, the, the local people were uh, indirectly uh, controlled by the Chinese uh, regime. Uh, during the early 20th century, Uyghurs were uh, able to establish their independence twice. Um, East Turkestan Republic and East Turkestan uh, Islamic Republic and East Turkestan Republic. So uh, let's fast forward to the 1997, which was a turning <coughs> point for Hong Kong, right? Uh, one of the scholars uh, interviewed many Uyghurs during that time, and then one of them said, actually many Uyghurs believed this uh, kind of uh, event, this kind of phenomenon would happen. Uh, at the date of the return of the Hong Kong, Hong Kong to China approached many Uyghurs felt confident that uh, their independence was imminent. Why? Because many Uyghurs believed that the Hong Kong people would not give up their freedom that easy. There would be some tension. And then what would, what would uh, happen after that? The, the people in China would get their freedom, their freedom their democracy. That was a kind of uh, naive uh, anticipation. But we can see that um, the, Hong, the freedom uh, which was uh, enjoyed by the Hong Kong people was highly appreciated by the people in China, especially the Uyghurs who are oppressed, oppressed uh, most in the, in the last few years. OK, so uh, since 9-11, there have been some uh, um, shifts uh, regarding the uh, oppression of the Uyghur people. Uyghurs, Uyghur tension in East Turkestan was, uh, was uh, labeled as ethnic tensions or ethnic clashes before the 9-11 events. How, what happened after 9-11 was the Chinese government uh, uh, used this uh, convenient uh, conflation of terrorism with Islam, and this started to label all the tensions in East Turkestan as terrorism. So let's, yes, uh, 2017, the inception of uh, infamous uh, re-education camps was one of the examples that Chinese government deemed Islam as an evil religion. Islam is automatically connected to terrorism. That's why Uyghurs are all suspicious. They are pre-criminals, they, they, they would, they potential, they are potential terrorists, so they need re-education in those not Nazi style uh, re-education camps. Uh, Adrian Zenz, one of the um, 
experts on this issue estimated that uh, now we have more than 1,000 camps in Eastern Number of detainees could be up to 3 million. We're talking about uh, 1 million detainees. That was like two years ago. It shouldn't be the same. Now we are seeing this escalation of this, uh, this, this thing. This issue has been, has been uh, growing. Okay, you don't want to do some. Okay, so this is the class. Okay, okay, <coughs> these are some leaked pictures from those uh, camps. As you can see, these are uh, virtually similar to prison uh, environment. Uh, these are inmates. They are calling themselves in the leaked documents. If you saw the 400 uh, page document, they Call these are inmates, not students. You call just directly calling them inmates, like prisoners. Um, and the testimonies coming from some very lucky uh, ex or four ex detainees, uh, or former detainees from those uh, from those camps, uh, have been giving their their uh, testimonies in many places. According to them, uh, uh, nobody was free in those camps. They, they don't know where, where, when they can be free from the camps. And uh, uh, food and water uh, was given only after chanting the slogans, uh, <coughs> given uh, pro-government slogans. And uh, beating torture uh, uh, were everyday practice, and uh, forced, forced medication is another, another thing. This is a very serious issue. Uh, which uh, leads to mental illness or infertility. Sleep deprivation is another thing, uh, just like in uh, many, many, many uh, prisons, prisons in, in China, solitary confinement, and sanitation, <coughs> poor sanitation as well. Crowded uh, rooms, like 20 people are sleeping, sleeping in a very small area, and some people should stand, others are, are sleeping, so this kind of thing. So virtually no, uh, there is no difference from uh, a typical Chinese prison. And another thing is like this one. Uh, we know we know that some uh, many uh, many in inmates from those camps have been um, moved to other places, and uh, so this is very suspicious because uh, we cannot uh, question uh, whereabouts of, of those people. We can connect this kind of uh, uh, this kind of uh, shift to the organ transplantation transplant uh, uh, scandal uh, in China, because as you can see, one of the uh, one of the um, uh, uh, journalists found out this place in Kashgar Airport. Is this is the special this is the special lane for organ. Uh, transporting. So you can see if there is a special lane, that means there are so many human organs, right? You cannot, you cannot, uh, you cannot go there and you can't be there when there's, a, there's, there's somebody moving or shifting human organ. That means this is a very widespread thing. Very suspicious. And if you go to Google, and if you Google, you can see the camps and before and after images of many camps just in the middle of a desert, okay? Uh, suddenly you can see that in, in, uh, uh, there's, there was nothing before, after one year, you can see a new facility. Very sophisticated facilities you can see. So, okay, so who are being taken to the camps? Let's see. Okay, so <coughs> there are some very different people. Some of them are philanthropists. They're just very well-known good people. Like they are helping uh, uh, poor people and orphans in society, and they're taken. One example of this is this person, uh, and the next one. Uh, so many intellectuals who have been um, studying Uyghur culture, including the one on the on the on the left. Uh, uh, Mohammed Salih, who 
ha, who's translated the Quran into Uyghur for the first time in the 1980s. He was taken to the camp when he was 80 something, and he he was released after a few months, and then he died after after a month or so. So we suspect that he was tortured a lot in the in the camp in the camp. That's why he was he was uh, he, he, he he was <coughs> by by the by the authority, Chinese authorities, of course. Okay, so let's see. Yes, this is uh, one of my professors when I was doing my first uh, MA. She was uh, my professor. She has been uh, studying Uyghur Islamic culture. And she was taken in 2017, and after that, we don't know where, where she is. She is just disappeared. Very soon. We are so much worried about her, and we don't know where she is. And we have been trying to find her, we don't know. This is really painful. And uh, some other people as well, and uh, some, okay, this is not working well. Some other intellectuals on the right, this, this professor has been uh, sentenced to death because uh, he was deemed as two-faced intellectual two-faced and in, in, uh, in, uh, nationalist uh, <coughs> kind of supporting Uyghur separatism. Okay, and some uh, popular figures like their voice singers and uh, <coughs> uh, 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 pop stars, okay, all of them, because they have done something very suspicious, right? They have shown their in nationalism and they've sh shown that they are not loyal to the Chinese state through some of some of their works, like uh, sing, when, for example, some of them are singing uh, some song and some some lyrics are problematic. That's a, that's a crime they mean. They they commit. That's why they are taken to camps. Okay, how about the kids of those uh, adults who are taken to the camps? They are uh, sent to the state-sponsored uh, uh, orphanages. Very beautifully labeled or, or orphanages, but you can see on the on the uh, here as well. You can see this. You can see the barbed wires on the walls. Okay, so they say these are very nice, beautiful orphanages or kindergartens, but it's virtually uh, the same as the prisons. These these kids cannot go outside. They cannot meet their grandparents, for example. Uh, they cannot meet. Uh, any other adults, they have to have some, some very special per, uh, permission from the government in order to, to, to meet uh, the people out, outside of the kindergartens or orphanages. And uh, they are not given mother tongue education at all. They're just given Mandarin Chinese uh, uh, classes and then just learning uh, Chinese uh, culture, that's it. So this is a very typical example of cultural <coughs> genocide. Okay, surveillance. We're talking about surveillance. Okay, this is also this is a very horrible kind of uh, development. Actually, the dark side of this uh, technology, right? So Chinese government has been using this uh, uh, high tech, uh, uh, high technology to suppress the Uyghur resistance and. Uh, uh, Huawei is one of the examples. I would like to uh, highlight uh, this company because Huawei is, is, is becoming more popular in Canada I mean, when the people are buying Huawei phones and they, they don't care. But we have to be very concerned about this because Huawei is one of those companies who have helped the government, Chinese government, <coughs> to, um, to track down, track down suspicious people, pre-criminal people, and then send them to or prison. Okay, so this is one of the platforms uh, uh, you know, developed by uh, a company very much like Huawei. Huawei is, they say, it's connected to this as well. This is like, uh, you can see this, it's not very clear, you can see, but this is the kind of mechanism. Uh, these are the suspicious things you, you did, okay? Somebody did some suspicious uh, had some, some suspicious activities, okay, and then track down, tracking down through the system platform, and then see, these are all the 
all the evidence that the, uh, you have the, the, the uh, criminal tendency and she should be sent to one of those camps. Okay. And uh, outside of the camps, okay, they are burning down Uyghur, uh, Uyghur books, for example, Uyghur, Uyghur books. Islamic books, okay, no question, burned down. But Uyghur books, Uyghur textbooks, all burned down because they say, okay, only Mandarin Chinese is uh, official. You should learn Mandarin Chinese. Uh, Uyghur language, Uyghur uh, language is not uh, useful. It is not uh, in line with the Chinese nation, unity of the Chinese nation. Okay, mosques, mosques have been uh, demolished. This is another thing outside of camps. Okay, before and, and after pictures, there are so many pictures. I, I want to, I have many pictures helping you to remember things, right? See, before and after images, the mosques being demolished, and all orchestrated tours, and all the OCSDG doctor, all the OCSDG came here, and he talked about this kind of one of, uh, one, this kind of uh, uh, thing, <coughs> is uh, visits, okay? If, uh, orchestrated visits. Uh, organized by the Chinese government, and uh, these are some <coughs> pictures from those. And the uh, BBC uh, reporter said this thing, this is horrific. So he said, yes, these are show camps. Okay, they know, we know these are show camps. So what might that say about places that uh, we are not given access to? So yes, even these places have barbed wires, okay? The show, show uh, camps, these are show camps. How about those places we are not given access to? This is horrific, right? Yes. So, yes, this is a new development. Now we know that uh, many detainees have been sent to some uh, factories and becoming slave workers. They say, oh, they are taking, they are giving, they are having like two thousand RMB a month. We don't know, but they say, okay, a kind of a middle class uh, salary, but. Yes, it's very sus sus suspicious because they they are not making that much money. <laughs> okay, and then they're working there day and night. We don't know how many hours they're working in the in the in the factories. This labor, this is becoming like this, and we have to be very concerned about the uh, for the fa foreign or foreign uh, uh, companies that are related to these camp uh, factories. For example. Well, yeah, response of the world, we all know about this, right? Canada has been responding positively, but not like the U.S. The U.S. has just, uh, yes, uh, introduced this bill, and uh, yeah, it's signed uh, at the final stage, right? Just before uh, uh, being signed by the uh, <coughs> President Trump, right? And uh, 22 countries signed a letter to condemn the Chinese, uh, Chinese uh, 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 oppression in Xinjiang, and we, we, we it's Turkestan, and 35 countries, Muslim countries, they have been very uh, disappointing in this thing. They are not uh, with the Uyghur people. So, absolutely no mercy. This is co coming from those 400 page uh, uh, linked documents. Okay, so that's the rhetoric behind uh, this kind of um, uh, uh, op oppressed cracking down Uyghur uh, descent or Uyghur people. Yes, yeah, so most recently they say, okay, most of the camps have been closed and this is like, um, of course, this is number one fake news, okay? They know and the world won't believe this kind of thing, but anyway, they're telling this line, okay? We're, we have closed down the, the camps. Okay, so the last uh, slide I would like to highlight this warning coming from Ruff. Uh, Kyle has just uh, mentioned Ruff, who has been denied Chinese visa because, uh, denied access to China because he <coughs> has been very vocal uh, regarding the human rights abuses in China. Uh, this morning I found this paper written by him. He warned like this. Let me read this. If not challenge it, Beijing's action protects portend a dystopian future in which no one is beyond the reach of Chinese censors and an international human rights system so weakened that it no longer serves as a check on government repression. This is a warning coming from him. So 
with this message, I would like to end my uh, talk and let's have some conversation. Um, we now have about 20 minutes for questions and answers, so I'd like to ask all the speakers to pull their, their chairs up to the table. And uh, so we're going to take questions from the audience. Uh, if you have a question, I ask you to lift your hand, state your name. If you have a theme with an institution or an organization, please mention it. So, yes. Hello, my name is Felix von Geyer. I'm actually a, a climate change journalist. Um, yeah, I'm going to pick up on your point on Tibet. I've had a conversation with the Dalai Lama that China knew full well what it was doing in 1949, but it was the water resource still is to, to much of uh, South Asia and elsewhere. Um, and it's a case of what happens if it starts to divert those water sources to, say, northern China to develop its railroads or its shale gas, which it doesn't have water to do. But moreover, what's the world going to do if China takes other irredentist policies? Because I think the least ethnic Chinese population of any of its neighbors is the Philippines at 25%. The most is Indonesia at 55%. At what point does it start to think, well, we're going to start to like, annex resources from our neighboring people, if not actual territory. Um, the Germans and the Russians have uh, pretty much have laid the, laid the pathway for them historically. Um, do you think that's something which Chinese are likely to do? And what can the so-called so liberal international order do to stop them? I'm not sure about Chinese, like, like what they would do, but um, in terms of uh, the issue itself, I think there's a need for greater awareness about Tibet being such a uh, important uh, in terms of the uh, environmental perspective. Uh, not many people know that uh, Tibet actually serves as a, a origin source for all these countries in South Asia. Um, there's a Canada recently, this newly elected government uh, prioritized environmental issues as one of the top priority. Uh, but yet we have very little discussion um, in Canada and in, in the rest of the world about how Tibet is you know, known as the third pole and how Tibet is important in terms of I think the first step is really to have more conversation, more discussions on the uh, Tibet being such a uh, significant uh, place for the environmental protection. Uh, I think there's a need for greater e interest and attention from all the affecting countries, especially the seven countries, uh, India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam, and China itself, of course. Uh, this not only affects the, uh, the, the two countries that, uh, uh, that I just mentioned, but China itself would be a victim, uh, would be affected severely if this is not taken as priority. But I'm not sure if I answered your question. <laughs> Maybe you think we really just get more awareness in your feedback. Yes. Yeah. So uh, there's another question in the back, sir. Can you Hi, yourself? Yes. Um, I'm Teddy Elliott from MTL Blog, and uh, I have a question for Mr. Benjamin uh, Peng. Um, in the summer of 2019, uh, Huawei announced that they would um, start developing 5G networks in northern communities for Inuit uh, and for northern Quebec. And today, Rogers announced that they will try to put a 5G network across Canada by 2021. Rogers never mentions um, in the report that they would be partnering with Huawei. But with Huawei's investment in northern Canadian communities, what do you think some of those, what do you think some consequences would be on those communities and on, and on Canada as a whole if Huawei is able to develop 5G networks in the north? Um, okay, first, first of all, it doesn't make a difference whether they are developing something for the north or for Canada. Okay, so the issue is the same. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's not a technical issue, it's a trust issue. Just like as I mentioned in my, in, uh, in my, in, in my, uh, in my talk, you, you trust Apple to update your iPhone. Okay, that's because the trust is coming from this is a public company. You know Apple is not controlled by some government. Okay, that is where the trust comes from. So in terms of Huawei, so you know that this is controlled by the Chinese government. So if 
the Chinese government give some pressure to the to the, to the company, it is possible that they can just inject some Trojan horses, uh, malware into the five G system, and it's actually very difficult to detect. It's not something like that you can check. It's not like buying I'm I'm, I'm buying a glass right? I can check it before it's, it, it, uh, before I, I, I buy it right. So. You, after you buy the 5G network, you need, you need to keep updating this so they can easily inject some uh, malicious uh, software in there. If that's the case, then they can at least they can get all the so called the metadata. Metadata is something like, for example, if I send you a message, the message is encrypted, so they cannot see the message, what, what we are talking about, but at least they know I'm sending you a message. This metadata is also very, uh, very, uh, very, uh, very uh, valuable. Mm -hmm. Just you can just based on the metadata to build the social network of the Canadian populations. Why this focus on the North specifically? Uh, I don't know this this specific piece of story. Why, why they focus on North? I, I'm not sure. Yeah. Anyone else in the panel want to make a comment? Well, yeah, I think it's in the north, I believe it's 4G that's going into remote communities in the north. Um, and with respect to Rogers, my understanding is they're using one of the other service uh, equipment providers, not Huawei. Um, so, you know, uh, that may be the explanation for why they're so certain they can roll out 5G in 2021, because they're not using Huawei. They don't need to wait for government approval whenever that's going to come. Uh, well, first of all, it's, it's very nice to see um, to see people, uh, those spokespeople for different uh, uh, causes, actually coming together to identify, uh, you know, the Chinese Communist Party as uh, the primary threat in common. Um, so that's that's good so far. And now we're here and we're hearing about it. And I suspect that you know, a fair number of people in the room are either activists or journalists. Um, uh, but on the other hand, from our government, uh, I personally have been disappointed by the response. I've found it uh, uh, underwhelming when it's not absent completely. So uh, my question uh, to you is like, what is the next step in order to broaden the awareness in the Canadian population? Uh, because I, I'm going to assume in the question that uh, it's public awareness that will cause uh, political pressure, you know, pressure on the politicians to address this issue. So how do we make this wider than people who are Hong Kongers, Uyghurs, Tibetan, you know, or, or directly affected in some way? How do we broaden this and bring this to the public? Who from the uh, panel would like to uh, offer some comments or ideas on building public awareness or political will that comes out of that? I guess I could start by just speaking at a fairly high level. Um, a lot is going on, on under the radar that the general public isn't aware of. Um, and I think, you know, there's a human rights branch in Global Affairs Canada. Uh, there are human rights uh, policy people who are focused on this 24 hours a day. Uh, so there is a lot done. There's, there's um, you know, funding that's available in ca cases that are, um, uh, highly uh, sensitive and, and urgent. And so there, there's a lot already, but, but it's difficult for the government to talk about what it's doing because it's so super sensitive. And so they quietly do this rather than doing it with a big amount of uh, focus. I think one of the things that I've said um, publicly is that 
Um, the, the turning point, I think, will be if uh, Michael Covert and Michael Scott are, are charged. Uh, so far, as far as we're aware, they haven't been charged. And once they're charged, that means they're there for the long term through a trial sentencing and some period of time in prison. Because 99% of cases in China are uh, found guilty. And, uh, and so at that point, I think there are a series of things the government should be doing, including Magnitsky, uh, acting on the Magnitsky, Magnitsky law that was mentioned earlier, reviewing our role in the um, Asian uh, Infrastructure Investment Bank, and uh, a whole, whole series of things that I've laid out in uh, a global mail op-ed uh, about a month ago. Which I read and enjoyed. Oh, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> so. and, uh, Anyone else? Yeah, I can also comment on the, um, on the, on the technical uh, dimen uh, dimension. So uh, for the si in the cyberspace, okay, the, 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 uh, the Chinese government has a spe specific army or units. It's called PLA unit. 61398, okay. <coughs> they are like basically a cyber army from, uh, from China. So they are not just trying to do cyber attack, in addition to do cyber attack, they also do uh, fake news, uh, start to spread the fake news. And uh, for example, you have, Canadians should pay more attention on the, um, how they infiltrate our social network. They create many fake accounts, okay? And um, for example, if there are two candidates, in some elections, the most simple way is to support A and then put down B, right? This is the most simple uh, techniques. More advanced techniques could be, they want to infiltrate into the supporters of B that they do not like, and then try to initiate some conflict inside the supporters of B, and try to split those groups into smaller groups and to degrade the power of B, okay? So this is some of the common techniques that have already been applied to Taiwan, to other countries. And, um, and we also have to pay attention to what companies do they, do they buy from Canada. Okay. So for example, in the United States, uh, the, some of the Chinese companies, they try to buy a company called Grinder, Grinder which is a social network for the gay community. Okay. They have a specific reason for doing this, right? Because if they buy that social network, they own the data, eventually they can use it to maybe blackmail <coughs> or to um, influence some of the American officials. They can do the same thing in, in, in Canada. So we need to pay attention on the government or to pay attention to how to <coughs> monitor the, these kinds of acquisitions. Sue, so quickly ask him. Oh, sure. It's a great question because uh, that's one of my concerns uh, I, when it comes to Canada-China relation is uh, we've seen strong interest from Canadian government and Canadians in general uh, since the arrest of Meng Wanzhou. Uh, but uh, my concern is that situation, the interest might just get you know back to what it was uh, after a few years if the, you know uh, if, if China decides to release uh, Michael's. So I don't know the circumstances of Michael. Uh, so I think we have to look at China, uh, not just in case of uh, the Meng Wanzhou case. Uh, it's, it shouldn't be treated as one singular incident. Uh, we have to look at this whole thing as a behavioral problem. Uh, for what it is, China is a bully. That's what I think uh, has to be a learning lesson. Because uh, uh, it would be a shame if we get back to uh, you know, recognizing China as an ally other things get back to normal situation. I, I, I admire the, the parliament for forming a new special uh, committee to uh, you know, have hearings on, uh, on China. <coughs> I think this will give an opportunity for um, the oppressed group of China, uh, is Turkestan, Tibet, uh, Taiwan, and Hong Kong, to share their concerns with the, the special committee, which hopefully would make a decision to take China uh, not as uh, you know, uh, ally in any sense. I would like to add this uh, boycotting, boycotting thing. This should be very powerful. Public has the power to choose, right? 
So we have to identify, we have to help people, I think, to identify which companies are accomplices uh, with the human rights abuses in China and they just are caught them. And we have to have more, uh, be more conscious about these things. And then, yes, that will be very helpful because the finance, this financial power of the CCP is the major drive that is that making them, like, yes, doing good things. Yeah, we have thank a question you. here. Yes. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Corey. I work with Uyghur Rally. Uh, we do some activist stuff around Uyghurs in uh, New York. Um, this is kind of a complicated question, but a theme that all of four of you were talking about a lot, or two themes, were kind of fake news and false information and kind of nationalism. Uh, particularly with Dr. Fung was talking about this being a clash between the idea of a authoritarian international order and a liberal international order. Now, in, in my work in, and in learning a lot about these issues, I, you know, I, I don't, there's so much about the liberal international order that I have so many problems with. Uh, I'm American, I really have, <laughs> there's a lot of things wrong with the American government, especially right now, and a lot of things wrong with the Canadian government. But this is, I feel like this whole movement is starting to play into China's hands where it's not really about human rights anymore, it's about East versus West, by supporting a different concept of what the world is an older concept. And by working with governments to do this, we, we're making it more about that than we are about what to me really matters, which is human rights, which is the, the horrible suffering that people in Hong Kong and Tibet and East Turkestan are going through. So I'm wondering, I'm asking this all the panels and all the activists and everybody in here, like how, how can we make this movement not about China versus the West? <laughs> and about the West concept of human rights. How do we take human rights and almost, it, the idea of depoliticizing human rights is in, it, it, that's like an oxymoron, but like that's what I'm talking about. How, how do we make this not about that? And I'm wondering if any of you have any thoughts and I'm making this not a cultural war, but a war for something higher than that. Hard question, sorry. <laughs> anyone wants to volunteer? That's a, that's a difficult one, but anyone wants to have a response? Well, I think just briefly, um, to the extent that we can engage the Chinese Canadian uh, population, they're often the victims of a lot of this because um, people might lo start to look at them skeptically. Are you on the side of China? And uh, and you know, the vast majority are not in the sense of being against human rights violations, etc. Uh, so engaging them and also engaging Taiwan, which is uh, an Eastern country, right? Um, not the West, and yet it's got a full-blown uh, democracy that we've just seen in space. So I think that, that those are a couple of things that we can do, but you're asking a, a really important question because I've seen the same trend and it's, uh, it's, it's not a good one and we sure don't want to go back to the McCarthy era. Um, my, my grandfather uh, was instrumental in stopping the McCarthy hearings and, and, and speaking to Eisenhower uh, at that time. And we, we don't want to go anywhere near that or what looks like that. Uh, so these are sensitive issues, but I think you know, there are ways of handling it. Um, I'm going to ask Dilarat to say a few words because he has to leave at two, which is one minute. Oh, yeah. Well, so, thank so you so much for yes. <laughs> Yeah, Corey, uh, you have a very good point. Yes, now. There is this ten tendency, maybe, conflating this uh, class clash of civilization with this kind of political development, right? East, East versus West. But yes, uh, I think Chinese government is playing this game as well, showing that part of Chinese culture uh, is, uh, is, is at odds with the Western democracy. For example, Confucianism is the best thing for China, and China that doesn't need democracy in that thing, meritocracy is the best thing for China, that, those kind of things. So we have to distinguish these things and then conflation of this cultural and the political thing, this kind of game. And uh, we have to be clear that this is about human rights issues, okay? Universal human rights, we have the, we have the norms, we have the rules, right? We have to just follow that. It's not about which culture is the best. It's about the human, human, dignity, human rights. These are the basic things. We have to we have to follow these. That's it. It's a simple thing. It's my from my perspective.
So we're supposed to end at two. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering for the three guests that don't have to leave right away, are you okay taking a few more questions? Mm -hmm. Okay. Then I know you have to leave, so get up whenever you want to. So we'll start uh, with you. Yeah, I just want to pick up on what he was saying. We're talking about concentration camps. Yes. We're talking about stuff that was as bad as what was going on in Nazi Germany. And we're sitting here. Why aren't we more outraged at what's happening to these people? And, and if we are outraged, what do we do to help them? Because this is, this is really bad. I just want to say it's not it's not about east versus west because if you in my opinion the CCP the, the Chinese Communist Party does not represent the, the Chinese community if you if tomorrow if you ask the, the, the Chinese do you want to have universal suffrage they will say yes they will immediately go to share your western value okay so it's not about east versus west it's about Chinese com uh, Communist Party versus the rest of the Western society. Well, I, I just want to add one thing. If you went to East Turkestan and ended up asked Chinese people there, do they support the Chinese government policy against Uyghur people? 99% of Chinese people will support them. We can see this from the video on the mm -hmm. YouTube. Yes. One journalist from British, British mm -hmm. asked one Chinese, very simple lady, if yeah. you support the Chinese policy against Uyghur people, she said, yes, I support. Yeah. Th this is the common Chinese. I'm, I'm really sorry to say that, yeah. but I agree. I, I, I stand up with my point. Most of the Chinese people at this point, they already updated their mind, brainwashing. Yes. You, you can't say that Jiang, Jiang Feng Shika, there is one, a YouTuber and a scholar from US, U, from USA, just few, uh, maybe four or five months before in one of his video, he mentioned the German, the Nazi, and at that he said, at the time the German people paid a price for the support the Hitler, and the don't, uh, he warned the Chinese people, nowadays you guys support the CCP, someday you will be punished by this. Yeah, the Chinese people support Chinese government. They support Chinese government, maybe on this specific issue, but we, we talk about democracy. If, they, if you want to give them democracy tomorrow, they, they will say yes. But there's fear also. Sorry, yeah. you guys are here to see. I know some other people yeah, have yeah. made comments. There's a few, a few minutes, yeah. and there's a lady here that had a question. Please introduce yourself. Um, hi, I'm, I'm a student at Nihil. And I know a few things that really um, uh, concern me is first, we have a club called the Chinese Student recognized by any international embassy, organized by the Chinese embassy. And I find it really concerning that we have a club that's organized by any international government. But uh, the second thing is also uh, me and my friend, we tried to start a Students Retreat to Vet Club, which is a, just a club to raise awareness about human rights issues. But we didn't get ratified for very uh, suspicious reasons. So now we're, uh, we're acting as an unofficial club. But this is a huge obstacle to like booking places on campus. We, we don't have that. We don't have access to funding. So it's very hard for us to proceed. But um, I was just, I guess my question to you guys is, um, what can we do, what can I do as a student or a, other students uh, to counter this increasing like infiltration of the CCP into like, um, North American universities and campuses and also to counter the, this increasing like uh, self-censorship from uh, the universities and academia? something, uh, not as a speaker, but Human Rights Watch has a code of conduct for North American universities over these issues, so you should probably uh, look at that online, it's called a code of conduct, and, um, and share it or send it to the president of the university. Yeah. Maybe you're from McGill, you can. Yeah. 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 I'm also from McGill, and we actually organized something um, about democracy um, in Hong Kong just a few, two months ago, and we also encountered a lot of obstacles. We're not a club per se, we were, it was just a one-hour pop-up exodus for four hours. We got people protesting at our booth. We got emails sending to the faculty members asking us to cancel, or like <coughs> do all sort of things to like, you know, shut it down. I think one of the things that I would do, the first thing is like contact your faculty to seek support, because if we can do 
free if we cannot practice freedom of speech in university campus, then we're supposed to be protected. Who else can we do it? We're students, right? This is our power, okay? Um, and it is also our right as we're on the left campus. And so how can your faculty gather as much social support as you can? Because if there are more people who show up, the less likely that you would have any kind of more imminent threats per se. So social support is faculty support and make it as well known as possible because if you're using social support is right for a lot of aggression. So I'll go for those. And we can talk more later. <laughs> but uh, yes sir. And then then uh, so I'll take one from you and then immediately after from you those will be the last two. Um I think what confuses me the most about these overarching issues with Tibetans and Uyghur people is that China seems to be able to do these human rights violations with impunity. And the international community can speak out against it, but only to a certain point, right? In your opinions, to what extent does, to what extent does China's financial and economic dominance of the global economy factor into how international communities are like handcuffed? speaking out of, against the government. Sure. Um, <clears throat> so I think as you pointed out, um, the language that China understands is definitely uh, economic financial language. And uh, <coughs> the lack of uh, more stronger pressure from the international community on Tibet issues and uh, Uyghur issues is, I think, in some ways uh, directly uh, related to China's uh, economic power. Uh, in terms of what can you know international community do, uh, for example, if if it was just Canada standing up against China, uh, we're talking about uh, much you know China's much bigger in terms of GDP and, and, and military size in any any uh, respect. But what needs to really happen is there needs to be a more uh, joint effort from uh, uh, Western democracies, or for that matter, not just Western democracies, but any democracy mm -hmm. in the world. I guess I, I would say you're asking a really fundamental question, and it really does go to the heart of the dilemma that the Canadian government is in now, because we got massive collaborations with China, Many of our corporations are in China, and we don't want to destroy those businesses. Uh, at the same time, we've now seen that China has malevolent intent against Canada. That's very clear. For one thing, they, they think it's a huge thing. We don't see it as such a huge thing. And it didn't even stem from our, uh, our original action anyway. Um, so uh, this is something that the, the Canadian government, and specifically the parliamentary committee that was mentioned, is really going to have to focus on. And um, I've, in my, in my own writing, have said that there will be areas where we will continue in the future to collaborate, but there are also areas we should start to look at to insulate ourselves from that pressure. Um, and it's, it's easier to have freedom to act if you're not um, subjected to having the turns, the, the screws turned um, on a, a you know regular basis uh, to, in order for them to get the behavior of our government that they want, and that's to me outrageous. So, um, so my comment is that um, let's compare Russians and Chinese. Okay, so. In the past, when Russia is competing with the United States, uh, they are selling their natural gas, exporting their natural gas in order to get some foreign income. They improve their military and their technology and then compete with the United States. In the Chinese situations, is that they are using the Western money. If you think about it carefully, think, think, think about where, where, does, where do you invest your retirement fund? Also, companies, many, many of them, they invest to, to China. They're actually using the Western fund to improve the Chinese technology and then beat up and go beyond 
the Western uh, AI or other te technology. So they are using your phone to beat you guys up, okay? And uh, so the first thing you can do is to stop the investment, okay? The, the previous uh, speaker talked about boy scouting. That's fine. It's very difficult to actually achieve. It's very difficult to ask everyone to boy scout not not to buy any products from not in, in China. But if you start the investment fund, give the pressure to your companies, it will make a difference. Okay, this will stop the origin of the funding. Last question. Please, there, any questions, please? Sure, yeah. Um, so my name's Rebecca. Um, as mentioned, I'm with McGill Students for a Free Shabbat. Um, my question is sort of surrounding, um, a lot of the panelists have touched on the effects of um, owning Huawei products and Huawei's active suppression in parts of China and abroad. Um, Students for a Free Shabbat as an organization has done a couple of campaigns around other big tech companies, for example, the Google Dragonfly search engine, which um, funneled out um, censored results, or um, recently Apple blocking VPNs for Tibetans um, inside Tibet. Uh, so I was wondering whether anyone might be able to touch upon the role of other major tech companies that we might know and use day to day um, in suppression. Um, I do not. I'm not able to link a specific company that that they relate to uh, any uh, suppression in China. But some of the uh, large company um, include maybe um, ZTE. ZTE. Is that, is that I don't know whether you are more familiar. With it. So ZTE is also another network company that is in the United States and Canada. I think there seems to be an understanding, uh, kind of a misconception among many Canadians that Canada's share of export to China is much larger than what it is actually. Uh, if I'm not wrong, it's just over 4%. Whereas Australia's share of export is much larger than that, and Australia has decided to say enough is enough, and they have decided to take a much tougher stand against China. So, uh, because China understands, as we just said, the language of money, um, and the share of exports becomes, uh, I think it, it should be an important criteria, but not the not most important. Should, uh, I'm, I'm not to say that 4% is not important, because after all, China is the second uh, biggest market after US, but uh, if we have to learn a lesson, then I think Australia is a good example. Well, with that final comment, I am going to make one announcement and then thank our guest. Um, for those of you who aren't on our listserv, please go to Mink's website, click on our newsletter. You can sign up to get notifications for all the events that we do. We have a really big uh, artificial intelligence human rights forum coming up in April that we're doing with LMKI with UNESCO, so if you're in technology human rights, <laughs> that's going to be a really fantastic event. And we do regular events, sometimes very private events, so sign up for an event. And last but not least, um, I, I want to thank our speakers for coming here today. You touched upon so many issues that I think are really, really important from a human rights perspective, foreign policy, but also internally what's happening in Canada. Um, I think that's exceptionally you know, great to have you share your knowledge. Um, I, I want to thank you for coming. Usually when we do these events, we have like half the people never show up. Even at the RSVP today, we have people sitting on the ground. So mm -hmm. I think it demonstrates there's a widening interest within Canadian society uh, at the academic level, but also the general public about China and these issues. And I think we're going to have further further discussions as the um, as the months and years move ahead. Well thank you very much.